Wow, you can be seated. What a song. You know what's even better? Hearing you sing it. Hello to everybody watching online, and thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you, Leanne. I uh, want you to know, uh, first of all, that uh, we're going to take a moment, pause, remember a couple of things today, and one is obviously 9-11. The other is that we had a Arvada police officer shot and killed last night, and it is tragic. Um, we are working with our Arvada Police Department. For you who don't know, we are the church for our first responders, and I do the memorials. I don't know if we'll be doing this memorial, but I just want to ask you uh, to join me in prayer for all of the survivors of 9-11 and now for a, a family uh, that's been uh, left without a son and a police force that's been left without another wonderful police officer. You know, this is just a tragic time. And so let's pray together. <sighs> Father God, our hearts are heavy for many reasons. We, we remember 21 years ago, Lord God, the attacks on this country, and more importantly, the, the nearly 3,000 that died and the thousands more that died in a war for 20 years. God, we lift up their families. We thank you for the heroic nature of every firefighter, and first responder, police officer, military. Lord, we pray for the families that still today probably look back and 21 years has passed so quickly it feels like it just happened. God, give them your comfort and peace. Bring, bring truth into their life so that they can know you as their Savior if they don't already. And Father, right now we lift up our entire police force here in Arvada. Thank you for Chief Link, who's a good friend of this ministry. Thank you for each man and woman who serves on that police force. And now, Lord, we lift up this family uh, who has lost uh, their, their dear family member and all the friends, all the police officers. God, may you give them that peace that passes understanding. Guard their hearts and minds. Guide them to you. And Lord, may you create healing in this community. May we bring hope to the hurting. Lord, when people hurt and kill, they are deeply hurt and disturbed inside. And the only thing that's going to transform anyone is Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. You know, as we have been in this series on struggles, I uh, think about those words that Pastor Jason and and Jake and the team saying, uh, he is all we need. I mean, think about that. He is our comforter, counselor, prince of peace, author and maker of everything, defender, deliverer, king of kings, he is, he is. You know, uh, when, when I looked at these subjects we're talking about uh, over the last few weeks, and if you haven't had a chance to hear any of this series, go back and listen as I talked about loneliness and depression and anxiety we talked about that first week, how to have hope in the midst of all of those. Last week, fear, how to live fearlessly. Today, I want to talk about anger. And I, I saved anger for the last one because I, I know a little bit about it. It's been a struggle in my life, especially growing up. And, you know, as I think about this issue uh, of anger, uh, you know, something that, that came to me as I was praying I thought back to that first message with Kimberly Britt when we spoke on hope. And you know, something that gives me a great deal of hope, and I was just talking with a beautiful couple uh, in my office uh, just a moment ago, and we were just talking about what God has done and is continuing to do in this ministry for 33 and a half years. You bring me great hope. We just got done with the study. I told you we would bring the study to you regarding the new community center. No, we are not building a new auditorium. We're not enhancing uh, the facilities for, uh, you know, a country club for Christians. We are building a community center to help the community, to expand our care for the hurting, the homeless, the broken, starting with our teenagers and our youth in this community, and so much more expanding the, the ability to care for you and so many more people. And you bring me great hope because after the study was done by the Steyer Group for nearly two and a half months, they came back 
with uh, uh, findings that were remarkable. 360 families, over 1,480 of you participated. And you might think, well, with, with thousands of people in a church and you know, thousands more connected, is that really good? They said it is unparalleled good. They never get anything close to this. And in 25 years, some of them have been doing this for 40 years. The company's been around for 25 years. They've never seen anything like it. And the purpose of the study was to really measure your support and the support of everyone for the project in the community center and the, what we're calling the Center for Hope. And also to identify campaign leaders and, and donor potential. And it has been remarkable. Like I said, they haven't seen anything like it before. So as you're looking at the screen and seeing some of the renderings and what's coming up, what they discovered is that 95% of those who were in the survey said, we are in favor of this center of hope. We are in favor of moving forward. That is remarkable. You can't find nine out of 10 people that agree on the Broncos having a good season this year. I can guarantee that. All right. That's amazing. Which they're going to have a great season. Uh, you got... 92% who said, we will make a commitment financially. That's remarkable. And of the 8% that said, we're just not sure right now, we're, we're praying about it, which is totally great. This ministry has never been built on pressuring people for money. And the clear participants, you know, came back and said, listen, we get the vision. It's clear to us. A reach center, a student center, support classes, etc." So based on the momentum that we gained and based on the study, they found that we could probably raise minimum 10 to 14 million. Now that is extraordinary. You guys are incredible. Now it's all paper money and monopoly money until we actually get going and we're going to start rolling. And so as elders, Pastor Jason and I, and as, as the pastors, the team, Brittany, who's overseeing this as our uh, executive pastor, um, we will get more information to you. I want you to go online and look at the Center for Hope. And we're going to put that up for you. I'm going to kind of point out, go to the Grace Church Co. backslash Center for Hope, okay? And we're going to get that information to you. You're going to be able to see far more than I can share with you today, okay? And just, you can click give to the new building, but what we're doing now is we're just rolling it out. There'll be much more as we move forward. There'll be other gatherings. I'm going to be meeting with many people and uh, we'll have more opportunities for more open discussion. But thank you. Thank you for your commitment. You're an extraordinary church because you believe in the community and the needs for the community. That's why we're here. We were not placed here to be a country club for Christians. We are here to bring hope to the hurting, right? You know, as I think about this, many of us struggle at different times with different emotions. We, we all go through it. We're all imperfect people. You know, the Bible says God created us. We're a masterpiece, but the first man in, you know, blew it for all of us. And we've all been infected with sin. Something I never have to convince anybody of is that they're a sinner just like me. But thank God for his grace and mercy through Jesus Christ, who he sent to this world to die for our sins, raised from the dead, and offered to us everlasting life, not by be in, be belonging to a church or becoming religious, but by believing in him. And we can overcome these struggles. Well, what about the struggle of anger? You know, I've had my battles with anger, and I wish I could say, I never get angry anymore. Well, it's not getting angry that's the problem. It's, it's the response that's uncontrolled that is the problem. Dr. S.I. McMillan did a study and along with many other neurosurgeons and other doctors found that there are 51 illnesses that can be directly attributed to uncontrolled anger. As a matter of fact, I read in the study that six proctologists said your anger literally creates a pain in your butt. <laughs> Growing up, anger was a pain in my butt, I got to tell you. And I didn't even know where it came from. I have like these really, you know, chill parents and chill brother and, and I just have this burning anger inside. And let's understand something. Anger is not always wrong. It's not always the wrong uh, response, but uncontrolled anger is always wrong. Okay, that's critical to understand. 
There are many situations where anger is the appropriate response. I mean, when somebody hurts my wife, I'm going to get angry. Somebody hurts my children or, God forbid, my grandchildren, I'm going to get angry. I get angry at the injustices in this world. I mean, I get angry that that thousands of people lost their loved ones on 9-11. I get angry at the abuses of people. Anger is appropriate. If I don't get angry about those things, it means I'm apathetic and I really don't, I just don't care. So God gets angry, but he never responds in an ungodly, unrighteous way. Did you know that there are 375 verses in the Bible? 370 times in the Bible, it says God got angry. However, he always responded perfectly. We don't. So we have to learn how to respond the right way. You know, how to let it roll off your back, just walk away. Now we're going to look at some of the wisdom from a guy in the Bible that was the wisest man apart from Jesus who ever lived. His name was Solomon. Solomon was the third king of Israel. Saul was the first, reigned 40 years. David, his father, 40 years. And now Solomon, who would reign 40 years. And in Proverbs 12, 16, he said this. Take a look at this. If you shrug off an insult and refuse to take offense, you demonstrate discretion indeed. But the fool has a short fuse and will immediately let you know when he's offended. Why is it always he, right? No, but I mean, you get the point when he's offended. We, we all need more discretion. We all need to realize that fools have short fuses. I remember uh, about uh, 1994, 95, somewhere in there. No, it had to be later than that. Uh, Sometime after 2000, my youngest son had been born. My oldest son and youngest son are 14, nearly 14 years apart. So it was the short period of time we had all four kids at home. And so we would get up in the morning and sit at the breakfast table, which was a rarity for us, especially at breakfast. And it was just a commitment I made, and I would read through the book of Proverbs. I wasn't preaching, I wasn't exegeting, I wasn't being pastor, just dad, read some verses, say a couple words, pray, and we go off to school, okay? Well, I can guarantee my kids probably don't remember much of what I read, if anything. But I know they remember being there. For me, it was life-changing. As I began to go through Proverbs again, not for the first time, I can tell you that, but maybe the 50th time at that point, I began to write down and underline and put to the side verses on being angry. I remember in Proverbs 16, 32, and in the Good News translation, which I was reading to my children, it says this, it is better to be patient than powerful. It is better to win control over yourself than to be president. Same thing than over whole cities. It is better to be patient. You know, I think I I learned uh, then that some of my anger stemmed back to just things that happened in childhood. You know, I was the oldest in my family, but there was just me and my brother, oh yeah, and 14 teenage girls. And during that time, I, I escaped the home as much as possible. And most of that was just spent being outdoors, competing in sports with the eight guys in my neighborhood. But I wasn't the old guy in the neighborhood. I was the fourth oldest in the neighborhood. And so there was a lot of, you know, jockeying for position, pecking order. I mean, some of these guys were bigger and stronger and, and they liked to bully and push buttons. And man, that, that got under my skin. I didn't do well with that. And so I solved problems with my fist. And that wasn't good. You know, we learn our attitude and our actions from watching our parents, our our siblings. We learn it from TV, movies. And, And the good news is since we learned it, we can unlearn it. Right? It's possible. And then as a believer, we have supernatural power. And I'm not going to try and diagnose this psychologically. I'm not a psychologist. But but I am going to tell you that anger shows up and it manifests itself 
according to Scripture, four different ways. And I've went ahead and labeled these in a way that maybe you can remember them. Let's take a look and see if you identify in any of these areas. Because I will tell you that your anger will manifest itself, if not controlled, in one of these four ways. And it could be any of these four. It could be all of these four at a different time in your life. The first way that it manifests itself, I call these people the machine gunners. <clears throat> these are the people that the moment they get upset, they just let it rip. They just let you have it, man. They mow you down. It's the <laughs> right? And, and they're the Mount Vesuviuses of anger. They're just a walking time bomb. And, and sadly, this is the most obvious type of of anger issue because everybody else struggles in a different way with their anger, but they're better at covering it up. The machine gunner just lets it go. And everybody's like, oh, that guy's got a rage problem. It's the guy again, right? You know, no, there's women that are machine gunners. Look at Proverbs 29, 11. Fools vent their anger. Underline that. But the wise quietly hold it back. You know, one of the, the best examples of that that everybody on earth knows about now because a billion people saw it was Will Smith walking up during the Academy Awards and open-handed slapping Chris Rock. Now, whether you watched it later on social media or you saw it live, you're like, is that an act? That's a joke, right? But then when you look back, you know, Will Smith is laughing at the joke until he looks over at his wife who is not laughing and then he's like, I got to take action and it was the wrong action a machine gunner just lets it go are you the machine gunner how about this the mutes the mutes get angry and they clam up <laughs> a lot of times the mutes point at the machine gunner and say oh you have a you have a real problem well so do you you see the mute gets angry clams up they don't speak they hold it in and they boil and seethe Sometimes it comes out just through their coldness. You know, there's a person in the Bible who had that problem. And we oftentimes refer to this individual as the weeping prophet. His name was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah started to really get angry inside. And guess with who? God. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that Jeremiah went 41 years preaching and teaching and nobody, absolutely not one person was transformed. I got to be honest with you. I preach 41 minutes and not one person is transformed. I'm done. I'm out. That's some kind of resolve to be faithful. You know, yesterday we talked about how uh, the mutes last night in the service are uh, oftentimes very susceptible to depression and even suicide. Yesterday was Suicide Prevention Day. And listen, if you are struggling, if you are even thinking about or contemplating suicide, I want you to know there are two avenues you have right now. You can call the hotline 988 anytime, 24 hours a day. You can also call the church 24 hours a day, and we will help you. But clamming up and holding it inside is not healthy. Look at what Jeremiah says in chapter 15. You filled me with outrage. <laughs> hey, God, you filled me with outrage. A lot of people say that about God. Why is my pain unending and my wound incurable, refusing to heal? Will you disappoint me like a stream that dries up in the summertime? What an interesting analogy. You know, I remember uh, watching... Uh, a person in my house that dealt with anger that way is my mom. She was the mute, right, mom? She's here, so I'm gonna be real careful about this. <clears throat> but anyways, the the mute just clams up. You know she's a, uh, they're angry, and uh, and I remember my dad one time as I got older. He's like, yeah, yeah. When your mom gets mad, I just kind of give her space. He goes, I call, my mom's Native American. We're Native American. She, my dad said, I call her sitting bull. Well, one day as I got older, I was at the house teasing my mom. She was mad at me. And I go, you know, after all, you are sitting bull. And she said, yeah, really? You're my son. Lots of bull. <laughs> I thought that's pretty clever, you know. Listen, the mute clams up. They clam up. They hold it inside. 
That's not right either. The third type of person, if you will, that manages anger in an unhealthy way is the martyrs. The martyrs. The martyrs are sadly convinced they are the problem even if they're not. I think sometimes we, we think that a person who is a martyr is just seeking pity, and, and sometimes that may be the case. But many times they just become the perpetual victim. They are pros at holding pity parties and inviting themselves to it. Uh, they tend to punish themselves. They're angry inside when somebody hurts them, when they've been abused, when they've been hurt. It's all me. You know, it couldn't possibly be that my, my dad is mean or my mom is crazy or my siblings are ruthless or, or my boss is, you know, out of control. It's just me, me, me. And if you're that person that walks around saying, well, I should have done this and I should have done that. I always say you're shooting all over yourself. <laughs> if you're that person, then you're most likely a martyr. And, and martyrs go on to bitterness and resentment and depression as well. You know who we have in the Bible that was the martyr? It was the oldest brother of the prodigal son. Now, if you don't know the story of the prodigal son, I'll sum it up very quickly. There's two sons. Their dad is infinitely wealthy. I'm not going to give you the spiritual parallel. It's God and us, but I just want to tell you the story. So the youngest son comes to his father uh, and says, I want my inheritance now. And his dad graciously gives him his inheritance. And he goes off and he lives by spending it all on prostitutes and the most debauchery and, and godlessness you can think of. And before long, he is destitute, finds himself in a pig trough, eating the pig slop. And he goes, what am I doing? My dad is wealthy. I'm going back home. And the Bible says, as he made his way home, his father saw him in the distance and he ran to him. That's our God. And he brings him in, and what he does is he, he yells to all of his servants, go get, kill the fattened calf, throw a party. We are going to celebrate our son, my son that was lost, is now found. And who's watching this but his oldest compliant son? Because if you don't know this, the youngest son's a brat, the oldest son's compliant. Anyways, that's it. Anyways, just kidding. Sorry, Rob. He's, I probably just got shut off from all TV programs right now. Anyways, Luke 15 says this, the older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him, come and enjoy the feast with us. The son said, Father, listen, how many years have I worked like a slave for you? Now, I just want to pause there a minute. Are you serious? This good, good father treated you like a slave? Then he said, performing every duty. The martyr's like, I do everything, right? Right? He goes on to say, uh, as a faithful son, and I have never once disobeyed you. You're perfect, but you've never thrown a party for me because of my faithfulness. Never once have you even given me a goat that I could feast on and celebrate with my friends as this son of yours is doing now. Look at him. He comes back after wasting your wealth on prostitutes and reckless living, and here you are throwing a great feast to celebrate for him. Yeah, I didn't give you a goat, son, for your faithfulness. I gave you goats every night. You ate at my table. You had everything. Matter of fact, Father goes, everything I have belongs to you, son. This is the typical martyrdom. He couldn't be happy for the restoration of his family or the happiness of his father because he was too busy being a martyr. Are you that person? And here's the fourth type of person when it comes to anger. The manipulators. The manipulators. Probably don't have a hard time guessing what these folks do. But I want to kind of put a twist on it. I, I think we may not understand our manipulation issues until we realize the parallel here. You know, it, it, their motto is don't get mad, get even. And every single movie that we have seen forever has been about vengeance. You know, Bruce Willis made a career on vengeance. 
Uh, Sylvester Stallone made a career, Rambo, Vengeance. I mean, who doesn't? Well, that's like one of my favorite movies. You know, he's, he's living out our secret fantasies of making the person that hurt us pay the price. And, you know, that scene when they're in the woods and he, he gets the sheriff and puts the knife up to his throat. I know it's really morbid. And he goes, you drew first blood. Let it go. Let it go. Remember that? You know, it's just like this great scene. We're reliving our fantasies in those moments. We can't really do that, but the, the manipulator wants to. And really, that only works in the movies, so what they do is they usually are sarcastic, they're subtle, and they work to destroy you from behind the scenes. They do things to make you look bad. They never own up to the fact that they're seething with anger. When you call them out like, hey, are you mad at me? Is something wrong? Oh, can't you take a joke? Oh, I didn't really mean that, even though I told 55 people about you. Or here's the best, over-spiritualizing it like so many Christians. Well, I was grieved in my spirit. Makes me want to puke, doesn't it? You know, when I think about religious people, who do this, and people who were the manipulators in Scripture, you don't have to look any further than the Pharisees and Sadducees when they wanted Jesus dead. Look at Matthew 26. At the very moment, the party of high priests and religious leaders was meeting in the chambers of the chief priest named Caiaphas, and circle this, conspiring to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. They agreed that it should not be done during Passover week. We don't want to riot on our hands, they said. In other words, um, hey guys, we gotta, we got to manipulate everybody. we got to manipulate the situation to get Jesus de- dead, basically. And if you're plotting and planning ways to get back at the person who upset you or hurt you, you're a manipulator. Now, all four of these are unhealthy, and all of us have fallen into one or all of them at a certain time in our life. So don't, don't sit there going, well, this pastor, I mean, hey, I've been there too. So how do we deal with it? Because if we stopped here, this would be incredibly discouraging, but hopefully it's insightful because I want us to leave in the next 20 minutes knowing how to deal with those crazy makers in our life, the people that get under our skin. At Grace, we call them EGRs extra grace required people. Now, listen, if you're wondering, you know, who the EGR is, or if you know who the EGR is in your life, remember, you are somebody's EGR. All of us are. And so we have to learn not only how to deal with people who push our buttons, but we have to know that other people's buttons are going to be pushed by us inadvertently. I remember years ago, I was really trying to be nice to this guy. He came to church for a while. He's still here. He's still here. And we, we went out one time and I'm like, dude, I just feel like you, you, there's a problem. He's like, no, I just don't like you. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that. Why are you here? Well, you know, like the church. I'm like, okay. Now today we're friends, but literally that's what he said. And I'm like, at least he was honest. Everybody is somebody's EGR. So how do we handle anger when people push our buttons. The Bible gives us five absolutely remarkable, but sometimes difficult to live principles. The first is this. You got to calculate the cost of anger. Before you respond, count the cost, man. Before you, and hopefully you don't react, count the cost. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we had an anger calculator in our phone And we could just pull up, you know, I'm going to say this, and I know it's going to bother them this way, and I'm just going to put an equal mark here and see how much damage it's going to cost. Well, we don't have that, but most of us have been around long enough to know if I respond this way to my wife, it's going to be devastating. If I respond this way to my boss, it could cost me my job. Look at Proverbs chapter 14. Solomon again says this, when your heart overflows with understanding, you'll be very slow to get angry. I want you to put overflows with understanding. Education, wisdom, intelligence is the key. But if you have a quick temper, your influence will be quickly seen by all. A tender, tranquil heart will make you healthy. 
Now, I want to go back to that statement that you got to get the facts. You got to have truth to overcome that. What kind of truth? We're going to look at what you need to know, what I need to know to avoid anger. But we didn't really need Dr. S.I. McMillan uh, to tell us that you know, anger is detrimental to our health. God already told us thousands of years before S.I. McMillan came along. And he's saying this, calculate the cost of your anger. Look at Proverbs 29, 22. An angry person causes trouble. A person who easily gets angry sins a lot. That verse rocked me. I wrote it down on a three by five card. You know, I considered myself as, as a Christian, as a pastor, as a father, as a husband, a guy that was trying desperately to avoid sin. And then I realized, you know, these angry moments, as rare as they may be, were sinful. And it causes you to sin. You fall into one of those categories, manipulator, mute, martyr. You know, uh, more importantly, you don't deal with it properly. I think about study I was doing in the book of First Timothy 3. And it was as I was moving into starting this church and becoming an elder, and it said, you know, a pastor cannot have a short fuse. He cannot be a brawler. Well, 35 years ago, I was in a football league, a church football league that turned into a brawl. And I, I'm ashamed to say I wasn't the guy stopping it. You know, that's not okay. And I think regardless of how long ago it's been, you have to always be aware of your anger. First Timothy tells us, don't, don't, don't be a brawler. And that means with your words as well. Look at Proverbs 15, 18. A person who quickly gets angry causes trouble, but a person who controls his temper stops a quarrel. So I want to encourage you to first stop and calculate the cost of your anger. What is going to happen if I let loose right now? Remember this, I always lose when I lose my temper. I always lose when I lose. You always lose when you lose your temper. You never win when you lose your temper. So calculate the cost of anger. Second, and this is very critical, look past their words, the people that upset you, the people that anger you, the EGRs, crazy makers, look past their words or actions and try to understand their hurts. You're like, well, that sounds really great, Pastor, but is that realistic? Um, maybe not without the power of God working through you. But if you can keep in mind hurt people, hurt people. Just hurt people, hurt people. And the more somebody hurts, the more damage they do. The more people they hurt. Because hurt people hurt people. I heard an actress, uh, it was some short clip, making fun of that statement. And I thought, you know, first of all, celebrities are so out of touch with reality. I don't, don't know why they talk about things. But she just said, hurt people, hurt people, really? And I'm like, yeah, really. You must really be hurting to make fun of that. You know, King David went through many moments of hurt and loss in his life. He caused some of it, but some of it he didn't. And there were two times in David's life when he was running for his life. One, from King Saul. After David had already been told by the prophet of God, you will be the next king of Israel, he had to subject himself to King Saul who tried to kill him minimum five times with a spear while he was simply playing music for him. And then he ran to get away from him. Then, later, his son Absalom, who wanted to overthrow him as king. And in the midst of that, he wrote this, Trust only in God every moment. Tell him all your troubles and pour out your heart longings to him. Believe me when I tell you, he will help you. You know that song we sang, he is, he is our counselor, he's our deliverer. David had to live this without the Bible. He had to live this knowing God's goodness. He would run off to the Judean wilderness once to escape Saul and another time to escape his son Absalom who wanted to overthrow him. You know, God is the only one who has the ability to forgive 
and forget. He can erase our sins as he does as far as the east is from the west. We don't have that ability. So we have to learn how to look past the pain and see the hurts of others. Look at Isaiah 43, 18. This is a command of God to his people. The Lord says, forget what happened before. Do not think about the past. Listen, some of the worst situations we deal with in ministry when it comes to marriage counseling are people who just can't let go of the past. I thought about an illustration that was shared with me of a fifth grade teacher and she had a class filled with fifth graders who were just, they were being mean, they were being nasty to each other, it was just a bad moment. And she said, okay, everybody stop, take out your pen. She gave them all a piece of paper and she said, I want you to write one thing on this half sheet of paper that hurts you, that you're hurting about inside. And they all did it. And she said, now crumble up that piece of paper and just throw it somewhere in the room. And that was a fun moment, like snowballs flying all over, right? And then she said, I want you to pick up the piece of paper near you and read it. It's a true story. Well, one kid picked it up and he read it out loud. He said, my dad left two days ago and I'm hurting. And all of a sudden a girl across the room said, that's mine. And she started to cry. And before long, the kids started to read them out loud. There was this amazing moment of healing. Why? Because the hurts were exposed. They understood where the anger was coming from. How do you handle it? Look past their words and actions. Pray, God, give me the ability to see their hurt. Third, this is critical. Think hard and then respond calmly. Think hard, then respond calmly. Don't respond hard. Think hard. You know, it's, it's critical if you can pause, if you can just pause in the moment and not lose it, it always results in a much better outcome. You know, I think about this in Proverbs 13, verse 16. God is very clear. He doesn't beat around the bush. Sensible people always think before they act, but stupid people advertise their ignorance. Remember the first time I shared that verse, I had a lady talk to me in the foyer, and if you're here, I apologize, but she goes, "Uh, we don't use the word stupid in our house. I said, well, God does. He said, that's stupid. Don't do it, okay? So here's a simple analogy I use when it comes to thinking before I speak. And you've probably heard this. You've heard it from me before. But I would put every action, everything that upsets you, every response through this five-part test. First of all, before you say anything, ask, is it true? Now I want to stop there because some of you think that's the only part that matters. It's true. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean you say it. Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Can you imagine, first of all, in our relationships with our spouses and family, how that would change things? Because so often we just want to say, is it true? Well, it's pretty simple. If you're smart and sensible, you will think before you speak. And Proverbs 29, 11 says this, you can recognize fools by the way they give full vent to their rage and let their words fly. But the wise bite their tongues and hold back all they could say. Just circle that, all they could say. So the best way to calm down, the best way to hold back is to first of all understand this. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And ancient Hebrew In this verse I just read to you, for the word hold back, you know, it's two words, but it's one word in the Hebrew. The word hold back literally means this in the Hebrew, cool it down. That's what it means. Literal translation means cool it down. So you could say in modern terms that the most biblical phrase you could use is chill out. Really. If you're getting upset, chill out. So I want to give you three questions. They they are life-changing questions to ask when you're upset. Before you ever respond, first, why am I angry? Why am I angry? So many times I realize in those moments, man, I'm angry because I'm proud. I'm angry because I didn't get, you know, my way. I'm, I'm not seeking God's way. And then you ask this question when you're seeking God, what do I really want? 
You know, what does God want in this situation? What do I really want? I want vengeance. I want tears. I want, no, I want peace. I want healing. And then how do I get what I want? Well, I'm sure not going to get what I want and what God wants ultimately by being angry and flying off the handle. Remember this, anger says in its mind, you owe me. Anger is the result of you thinking, you owe me, I owe me, God owes me. And anger is always caused as a result of one of three things in the Bible, three realities. Hurt, we already talked about that, when somebody is pushing your buttons or offending you, they're hurt, now you're hurt. Second, loss of control, loss of control. And you know what's sad is we really think we're in control and we're not in control. And then, of course, fear. When you feel attacked, you're afraid, most of the time that you're losing control. So as you write those down, Proverbs 17 says this, can you bridle your tongue when your heart is under pressure? That's how you show that you are wise. An understanding heart keeps you cool, calm, and collected no matter what you're facing. When even a fool bites his tongue, he's considered wise. So shut your mouth. When you are provoked, it will make you look smart. (laughs) I love that. I may not be smart, but I'm going to look smart in this situation. Now, fourth, you got to pray. Pray for God's spirit to take control. Now, you may not be a Christian. That's okay. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're watching. This is an area you might just go, I'm going to stop and pause and Speak to the sky. That's up to you. But for a Christian, we know God's Spirit lives in us. And we know that the fruits of God's Spirit produces in us the ability to overcome anger. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read the fruits of the Spirit. And you will see that every fruit of the nine fruits of the Spirit combats anger. Look at this. But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions, joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. And then look at this. This is so critical, especially for religious people or Christians who have a tendency to put you know, the law or truth above everything. He says, never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. That's why our motto in this ministry is love no matter what. Love no matter what, but we have to live that. So as we do this, we think hard, we, we pray for God's spirit to take control, and then finally, you gotta base your identity in Jesus because if your identity's in your job, then everybody that threatens that is gonna make you mad. If your identity's in your marriage, then anybody that threatens that, including your spouse, is gonna make you angry. If your identity is in being a parent, All of those things may be worthy of of investing in. They are, but not putting your identity there. Your identity is not in who you are. Your identity is in whose you are. I think about Chris Santa and Renato. Listen to their stories of overcoming pain in their life and anger. Take a listen. My struggle is um, not dealing with parents who were separated? Um, I, I grew up in a dysfunctional home, like so many of us. Um, I didn't have the greatest example of what a healthy marriage should look like. Um, growing up, I struggled with not knowing who my father was, and just growing up without a dad has put a lot of um, almost like an identity crisis. Like I didn't know who the other half of me was. I didn't know if I belonged anywhere or I felt unwanted. I really didn't realize that 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 would be something that I would carry um, throughout my life and actually into my first marriage, uh, which ended in divorce after, after 14 years. I don't believe you go into marriage ever thinking that it would end. I felt like I didn't belong. Um, I struggled to know who I was, and um, a lot of anger was a result of that. I grew up feeling very angry internally, and although I didn't do a lot of, um, you know, 
releasing it, I, I held on to that anger for a really long time and um, I just kind of stuffed it. That's, that's the coping skills that my family and I um, were taught and, and we rolled with that. You know, I grew up really only knowing one emotion and that was anger. I, I did not handle my first divorce well. Um, and sadly, um, my sons who I love dearly um, paid the price for, for my inability to cope uh, well with, with that divorce. I became a single mother myself and I knew that I wanted to raise my child in a different environment and I wanted to do right by him and I felt like church was the place. I, I wanted to bring him up with faith and I wanted to raise him with a, a strong faith. It, it was only until my second divorce that I was able to have these heart-to-hearts with my, with my now adult sons. My eldest son called me. Um, he says, hey dad, how are you? I said, I'm doing okay. And then the way he asked me again, he said, Dad, how are you? I remember spending a day with him so I could tell him what was going on in my life in, in a very, very private moment. He said, Dad, promise me you won't do anything crazy. It scared me to think that somebody from the outside was seeing somebody who was lifeless. I wasn't alone in my struggles. There were many people struggling and experiencing difficulties and I was um, looking for opportunities just to become a better version of myself for the sake of my son. I mean, to me, he's, he's the reason why I get to do what I do, and I'm excited about um, just where his journey's gonna take him. So, I remember specifically, my brother had invited me to Grace Church. And I remember the sermon specifically that was going on when I started coming to Grace, and it was identity in Christ. And I will also say this, often when I come to services, I feel like the whole worship center is empty. And Pastor Rick is just talking to me, specifically. And I felt that way when I started coming to Grace. And I remember seeing this advertised bulletin right on the screen that said divorce care. I didn't know such a thing existed. So I came halfway through that class. And you know, the beauty of that community is you know, we are all unique. But what I discovered was my situation was not. God is always working because um, although I, I didn't know my dad growing up, um, I feel like because I've been doing the work on myself and God has been so gracious to me to reveal where my hurts are and he's been working on me constantly through programs like CR and all the family support classes that um, he laid it on my heart that it was finally time to accept um, an invitation to meeting my, my real dad and after 38 years I was finally able to meet him and his family and it's been such a blessing to feel like I can identify with the other half of me for once. I know what he looks like, I know his background, we can share our stories, and God has been just so good in that way. He is our deliverer. He is our comforter. You know, when we base our identity in Christ, we have to remember he is in us. You know, Renato leads our divorce care Chrisanna leads our divorce care for kids. Because what you do is you take your deepest hurt and let God make it your greatest ministry. Because nobody can care for those who are going through those problems like those who have been there. 
Romans 14 verse 13 says this, so stop being critical and condemning of other believers. You know, it was already a problem in the early New Testament church before it was even called the church. But instead, determine to never deliberately cause a brother or sister to stumble and fall because of your actions. Stop being critical. Love no matter what. Love trumps all of it. That's not just some you know, great phrase hippies used in the 60s. That's the word of God. Love no matter what. Look at Romans 13, 14. Instead, fully immerse yourselves into the Lord Jesus, the anointed one. And don't waste even a moment's thought on your former identity. Circle former identity. To awaken its selfish desires. It means it is possible to awaken your selfishness when you're not what? Fully immersed in Jesus Christ. Your identity in him. We started with Solomon. We're going to end with him. Fear and intimidation is a trap that holds you back. But when you place your confidence in the Lord, you will be seated in the high place. Everyone curries favor with leaders, but God is the judge and justice comes from him. Calculate the cost of your anger. Look past their words and actions and see their hurts. Think hard, speak calmly, pray for God's spirit to take control and base your identity on Jesus. Now, listen, before we put things away and everybody here, we're going to sing. We're going to do some amazing worship. I had the privilege last night of being out there with, for worship at the end of the service, and my youngest son was next to me singing his heart out. He has such a beautiful voice. And he said, Dad, it's the first time I've been with you in church. You know, it is a great opportunity to just worship God. And maybe you're here, maybe you're watching, and you don't have an identity in Jesus because your identity is in your job, your career, your family. All those things that are wonderful, but they're passing. God tells us this, I love you. I love you unconditionally. And even though man sinned and blew it, from the moment Adam blew it, God made a way. And he made a way by covering their sin. The first blood was shed. And that was a picture that one day, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world, would pay once and for all for our sins. And Jesus Christ came into this world wrapped in flesh, never sinned, never did anything wrong, and he willingly went to the cross and died because God's holiness demands a perfect sacrifice, and only God in the flesh could pay that. As Jesus hung on the cross, he said those three most profound words, it is finished. The price of sin has been paid. Power of sin broken. Penalty of sin served, and you can be saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And the Bible says this, in three more words, three days later, he is risen. And the power of his resurrection lives in and through us. If you have never come to that place where you put your trust in Jesus, not religion, not being a good person, not trying and trusting, but believing in him alone, do it. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And he can give you the power to overcome your anger. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. If you're here and that made sense to you or you're watching, I just want to challenge you right now in the quietness of your mind. You can just say something like this, God. I don't understand everything, but I admit I'm a sinner and I admit that, that I've done things wrong. But today, I realize you love me. And you sent your son to die for me and to pay for all of my sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. And I believe he did that. And right now, I receive the free gift of salvation. My friend, the moment you believe, you are saved. The Bible says God takes hold of you and no one will pluck you out of his hand. So if you made that decision, welcome to the family of God. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward, but with heads bowed and eyes closed in a moment. If you made that decision, I'm going to have you slip up your hand and put it right back down. That just tells me you got it. So if you're saying today, I made the decision to trust in Jesus, would you just slip your hand up? Just slip it up and put it right back down. God bless you guys. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you, man. Praise God. Welcome to the family of God. Listen, we, we have some, some gifts, some resources to help you grow. We've got a new Bible. Uh, my latest book, Grace Happens, which is a devotional to help you grow. 
and some other resources. You can do something very simple. You can text the word believe to 720-895-9000 and we'll get it to you this week. Or you can just stop by the Connection Center after these songs of worship and ask for a new believer bag. And they'll give it to you on the spot. Father God, thank you for these you've called into your kingdom. Thank you for your mercy and grace. And God, may we honor you in allowing your, your spirit and your truth to guide us when we get angry. Father, we know that at the end of the day, you make all the wrong right. And that in eternity, there'll be no need for vengeance or revenge, God. So may we live today as if we are seated there. In Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord together, right?